Gentlemen, for the new film, Don't Kill It, which is out now, did your distributor have any kind of demand for how many dead bodies were in the film? I mean, was there, was there a body count that you had to meet? No, I would, I would actually sort of phrase it more that they indulged me on that. They were kind enough to not, uh, not, not get in the way that was certainly a prerequisite for wanting to do it was, uh, you know, is, is how many people can we kill in, in an 85 minute running time? So they were very kind to, to let me do it, so. Yeah, I think it was, they wanted uh, no less than 300, wasn't it? I think, I think so, yeah. yes, totally. It's, it's one of my favorite things that, that you know, when, when someone, uh, I feel like, lets me make a movie, because I always feel like, you know, I'll say something like, okay, and so then you, you strangle the child, and you lift him, and, and I'm sort of waiting for, like, someone to stop me, because in my mind, I'm like, I can't believe they're letting me do this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's always a, a good feeling that we're onto something good, so. Any other things that the distributor asked? I mean, were there certain scenes I know uh, without a shirt on, or were there certain things that they really, I mean, in all seriousness, wanted no, as I, part I, of the no, film? No, they were very nice, actually. They were very easy to work with uh, creatively. I think, you know, the one thing about this project, everybody loved the script. And we did a little, there was a little polish that Mike did on it that made it better. Just added on the bar scene in the beginning and all. But no, the distributors were quite good about everything, except they had to be shot in 17 days. Right, yeah, that was totally, the only problem. Yeah. But um, so I think you know uh, it was more like uh, it was financial issues. But I think on yeah. a creative issue, uh, there was nothing really. Yeah, they were super we, supportive. Yeah, the challenge very, very cool. was always budgetary. You know, you're always you know time is always the enemy. But they were very much on board, and I, and I was surprised. I'll, 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 sometimes you do get producers that want to impose their will, and like, but but they let us make the movie that we wanted to make, which is very rare. And I really thank them for that. Hmm. Well, I'm wondering too who hired whom because I know you're actor producer yeah. and you're the director, so. Uh, and you were in the crowdfunding video. So who hired whom for the movie? Um, well, I think I hired myself first. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it's I read the script, <laughs> thought it was good, got involved with the producers, uh, met with Mike. It all happened concurrently. It was, as usual with these independent movies, it's not a simple shot. There's like, there was like some other producer who then was side railed, he wasn't part of it anymore. Right, yeah. And, um, he died, I, did you know that? Yeah, I know, he yeah. never heard of it, yeah. But I mean, there it was, it was like I met Mike and I'd read the script and I really thought it was great and then I kind of support the, try to support the filmmakers and you know in their endeavor and including uh, raising funds for it. It's clear that this is like passion behind it and that you wanted to be a part of it. You know, you were in the Indiegogo video, but I have to take another sort of turn and that is to stay in this industry and take a job that you don't want to do. Um, how is that for either of you? And you don't please don't name projects that you don't want, but Ones that you've been a part of that you feel like you have to keep you mean the like engine the going. You mean? Oh no no no! I'm just no, I, I, I'm I, no, I wasn't going. I wasn't going there. But it, everyone has to do certain jobs they don't want to do, and they know that it's part of the machine. And how is that for the two of you um, to know that that's part of being in this business and staying relevant? Well, I can start then. I, you know, look, it's all in your inner attitude. You know, you say you don't want to do it. Well, that's that's being kind of simplistic about life because you can always find some good in any experience, even a bad experience. Something you think is bad could be a good experience. You don't even know that until years later, perhaps, or weeks later, or days later. You know, sometimes the bad things in life where you're being tried is, is the things that make you grow. So, I mean, I look at it that way. So, say if I, if I need to pay off my divorce, for instance, and I need to do a couple of movies, I always try to find some good in each of those roles, even if perhaps if I was sitting on a pile of money, I didn't have to take that job. Maybe I would have waited around for something better. But, you know, what you think is better, <clears throat> a lot of actors consider I don't wait for a long time and nothing happens. But a lot of times you can do something and, and out of that energy comes something that you can't even imagine, you know. That's just how life is. So, so I just... I just take any role and I just try to make the best of it and try to enjoy it. That's how I look at it. And this wasn't one of those pictures. This was one of something I wanted to do. But I do s stuff, you know, that sometimes I'm not 100% sure about. But you know what? Most of the time afterwards, I, I'm glad I did it. I always think that because something good always happen, you know. So you, even if you're dreading when the alarm goes off, you, you try to find some kind of gift that maybe you could learn. I'm from. not dreading it, but I, it, you may be less excited about it, but... You know, you meet somebody on that set, or you learn something as an actor, or there's some revelation you come to by 
going through the hardship. Not, not really. It's part of life. It's part of the experience of, of this life, you know. And I guess fortunately for me, or, or unfortunately, I'm not sure, I don't find myself in that position too often because it's not like people offer me large sums of money to do anything. So, so I just have to kind of, you know, find a project because, you know, these are low-budget films. You you're kind of want to find the, the best thing that suits you the best. So when something is a not particularly great script that is not offering you a lot of money and there are very few perks, it's quite easy to say no, thank you, uh, perhaps, perhaps another time. Uh, so you're kind of just trying to find the best projects that, that excite you and you can find something good about it and, and try to put the best, your best foot forward and trying to make the most out of it, uh, out of those situations, but you know, so. So kind of like Dolph saying is always try to find the, the if there's a silver lining and, and if there's a thing, then, you know, then seriously consider that and try to put your, you know, try to make the best thing out of it. So Mike, according to your IMDb, you have 24 credits as an editor, 10 as a director, and only six as a writer. So it's surprising to see that you haven't spent more time writing scripts. Right. I'm just curious what, what the reason is. And Oh, it's a long-winded answer. Let's see here. Uh, so why don't I write scripts? So I, I, I'd say, like, when I, I had my first film in Sundance, uh, I had a lot of writing opportunities, and uh, they all got rejected, you know. And I, I would have a, what it's sort of, I almost have this kind of almost, you know, reaction that directing to me I always feel rewarded and always good, and writing I always feel rejected. And, uh, you know, I almost feel that you're like, it's, it's too much on you if you write and direct. And so at least, and again, I, I don't know, maybe this will change one day. I like collaborating with people, you know. I just, my, my role as a director, I feel kind of, you know, also goes working with a screenwriter. The same way I'd work with, with an actor or a cinematographer or anything like that. It's, it's about collaboration. So I, I think part of the, the, the key to being a decent director is knowing that people can do the job better than you. And so I feel there's a lot of people who, who are better writers than me, so why not collaborate with them? And I still get to put my stamp on it and put you know what I'd like to do uh, by doing my polish and working with them. Uh, without having all the pressure of like it's all on me if people hate the script you know you know or the movie it's all on me you know uh, and so so I don't know I just sort of found that that works better for me working with writers you know so. Dolph, we have a lot of actors that uh, watch our channel, and um, I know you have a fascinating story of how you got into acting. Uh -huh. But in terms of today, 2017, what would you recommend to someone that maybe is back home in Sweden or somewhere else here in the U.S. that wants to come to L.A. to be an actor? What would you say to them? Um, well, I'd say you follow your dreams, you know, follow your instincts. Uh, as was it Stella Adler who said, in order to be in this business, you need the or was it the, the soul of a rose and the hide of a rhinoceros? So uh, that kind of sums it all up. You know, it's, you know, you're trying to protect that creative part of you by dealing with a lot of BS every day. And, and sometimes you get to express that part of you that's, that you want and the reason you got in this business in the first place. So I think people should just follow their dreams and not be afraid of failing and trying again. And, and you know, I mean, great actors. I look at Morgan Freeman, for instance. Ran into him not too long ago. Great guy. I mean, nobody knew who he was until he was about 50, 55 years old, right? He'd done all of these movies, and suddenly he was in the Driving Miss Daisy, you know. And, then, and so there is a guy who probably had to deal with a lot of rejection and failure, and now he's, you know, one of the greatest actors in the country, so in the world. So you, just, you don't give up. That's the main thing. Don't give up. So if you were going to give him a pep talk. <laughs> before they yeah. they came out here. Because I think a lot of people come out with the idea, especially if they're told that they're great looking, you know, back yeah. home or whatever. And then you come here and there's so many great looking people that it's just like it's almost overwhelming because you you felt special maybe. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean uh, LA is the place everybody comes from the whole world and uh, I guess you just gotta believe in yourself and work on your craft and it really basically comes down to your ability to to uh, entertain people you know on on screen if you if you're in the film business or a TV business you know so when you get your shot you got to be ready to take it and then you got to really go for it at that point you know if you know but like I said it's there's all this time that time in between which is tough was it um, Michael Caine said you know they pay me to wait acting I do for free right so there you go it's a lot of waiting around 
So you just, just got to stay at it and work out and stay healthy and focus on your craft and go for it when you get a shot, you know. I find that interesting in terms of being ready when mm. something's presented. And I've heard that before, too, that yeah. uh, most people aren't ready. They think they are. Were there ever times for the two of you, um, maybe we'll go back to you, Mike, where you weren't sure, actually, am I really ready when something came your way and you had to check yourself and say, this is happening and... Well, I mean, I think that could be said almost uh, with, you know, any every project or every film, you know, uh, every everything you hope is a new challenge to yourself and you're trying something a little different that, you know, it's never, you know, oh, you know, at least for me, it's like I can never just kind of walk through a, a movie or just phone it in because there's always a new challenge. And there's always a new thing. I have never worked with a legendary action hero, you know. So, so that was a, a thing to, to like. Okay, how's this gonna go? I had never worked with a giant CGI spider before, uh, <laughs> it, you know. And so, uh, you're constantly trying to find uh, new challenges for yourself, and and you always question, you know. I mean, at least I I, I feel it's healthy, you know. Uh, uh, most of my my friends are, are filmmakers, and uh, you know I. I See, see it in them when a lot of them get a big opportunity and they're nervous. Even though they might have had a lot of success before, they're nervous. And, you know, what we always kind of say is like, like, you know, that's good. You know, if you're not nervous, then I, I don't think you're, you're in the right place. You know, you should be nervous. You should be uh, questioning if you can do it and the right thing because, you know, you're... I think you only progress if you kind of put yourself in that uncomfortable space. If you sort of kind of like, no, I just like doing this and I'm just going to do this. I, I, I think you become complacent. I don't think you do interesting or exciting work. So, you know, I think it's always important to kind of, you know, be out of your comfort zone. And also, I just want to add that really, you know, it's, it's life that matters. Not only what you do on film or on television, because it's your personal growth. Ultimately, that's why we're all here. I mean, you can do great work and then you get fat and kill yourself, you know, after a few years or commit suicide or you know, become a drug addict there. And you can still have great, do great work, but, you know, it wasn't such a great life, maybe, for you or for your children or for your family, your friends. So you have to kind of stay close to yourself and your personal growth while you're trying to get this other stuff done in the business. And that's kind of, that balance is quite hard to hit. And that's, I think, where... You know, I, I, I work on that every day, and I think a lot of, you know, I think that's one of my strengths, perhaps, that I've stayed kind of close to, to who I am, who I was, before I got in here in this crazy town, you know. And I think that is what people have to remember, because that, that's the big thing that'll derail you. Failure or success can screw you up, you know? It's the middle way, like Buddha says, the middle way, that's where you should be most of the time. And that's, that's the healthiest way of existing, I think. Because the big stuff is great, but it always goes away and it can lead to a lot of negatives. And the really lows, too, are tough as well. So, you know, you're trying to stay in the middle ground. How was that for you to do the TED Talk? Because, you know, you, you showed yourself as human. And for yeah. most people all around the world, they see you as superhuman. <laughs> and so how yeah. was that for you? Because people do see you. They call out your name as your character. Oh, Gunner, you know, yeah. but, but you're actually, you're a human being. And yeah. you revealed a lot of uh, very human things. How yeah. was that? Uh, the TED Talk, yeah, I did. This is mostly about my dad and my upbringing and the abuse and things like that. And, and also trying to help other people by helping yourself, and then your next step is you help other people. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, it was, it was very emotional, and it was difficult to prepare. It was difficult to get up on stage and, you know, stand still and reveal those things, and, um, but it felt really good. You know, and afterwards, you really feel like a personal accomplishment. That it was, to me, that's one of the, you know, most important moments for me in my career. Not, I mean, movies are great, and that's what the fans see, but for me as a person, that was a great moment, for sure. I'm glad you liked it. Thanks.